Good evening, everyone. My name is Gilbert, and on behalf of Raman's Bookstore, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with David Judson, presenting his book, Judson, Innovation in Stained Glass. We are so excited and grateful that uh, Romans can continue to bring authors and their works to our community uh, during this time. Romans Live will continue to host virtual events and you can learn more about them on our website as well as our social media. Our next event is Tuesday, June 9th at 6 p.m. with Margaret Stoll and Melissa De La Cruz in conversation with Tahira Mafi discussing Joe and Laurie. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speaker uh, to answer, please click the Like button. We'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, if you'd like to purchase a copy of tonight's featured book, you can click on the green Buy Judson Innovation and Stained Glass button right there. Um, you can uh, they'll take you that link will redirect you to our romans website where you can continue your checkout process uh romans is offering curbside service at this point so you can opt for that for uh, the copies that we have in stock we will be working um, on getting signed copies into the store uh within a week or so uh hopefully um once we're able to do that, yeah, you'll be able to order those uh, by requesting a signed copy in the comment section if you do it online, or you can just call the store. Um, we do have uh, phone orders at this point. Please be patient as we are working with a small crew, so it does take some time. Now, with all that said, let me introduce our author for this evening. David Judson is president of Judson Studios, the fifth generation of the Judson family to lead the studio since it was founded in 1897. David oversees the studio's creative process where he works with architects, designers, and artists who turn to Judson for its legendary work in stained glass. In 2015, he opened the second Judson Studios facility, which incorporates the firm's innovative fusing technology that allows fine artists to express their vision in glass. David is also the president of the Stained Glass Association of America and lives with his family here in Pasadena, California. So. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome David Judson. Hello, Great. David. Hello. Thank you, Gilbert. I appreciate that. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, tonight I have a presentation that I'll be presenting, and then I think uh, we'll be taking some questions afterwards, like you said. And um, so I have quite a few slides to get through, um, and so I hope to jump right into it. Um, I did want to thank you, Gilbert. You've been a great help for for helping set set this up, and it's great to be working with Romans. You know, two two very old uh, LA Southern California companies. You know, uh, with uh, I think Romans 1894. 1894, you're right. Yeah, yep. and, and and Judson 1897. So it's it's kind of kind of fun. I, I go through our library at the studio and see uh, old old books with Roman stickers in them for very many years ago. So it's kind of fun to see. That's right. That's great. Um, so. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, you know, it's unfortunate this this has been a really crazy time. We had a book launch scheduled, I think it was March 17th, and it was just before everything kind of shut down. So, um, you know, this is really the first time that I've been able to kind of uh, present the book and and uh, share it with all of you. And so, um, the lecture tonight is really uh, the 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 slides that I have are really about. Um, Kind of the history of the studio and also what's going on today. And so, um, like I said, I have a lot of slides to share with you. And um, I'll kind of walk you through a little bit of the, the uh, you know, the, the different things that are going on now, because not only is Judson kind of rich in history, but it also is very exciting about to see what's going on today. Um, so, one of the first things I, I kind of ask people, want people to think about is, is you know, when, what do you think of when you think of stained glass? What comes to mind? Because I, I've noticed that most people have um, some kind of a, a, a preconceived notion of what stained glass is to them. And so, you know, whether it's you growing up in a church or the church you go to now, or maybe, you know, you have a relative who, who does stained glass, um, it's, it's always something that you kind of have in your mind. And I'm hoping tonight that, that I can change that a little bit. Um, 
And I start with this image because I think this is a, a fairly recent image, but it's a very traditional image and, and somewhat kind of, um, you know, some this is what you expect to see. Um, and this was made in 2010 by Tim Carey in our studio. And at the same time, the same year, this window was made. So it's the same subject matter, but it's a very different window in that it's it's very kind of contemporary. Um, it's made with uh, flash flash glass, which is you know if you look at the lamb there that's white, there's a there's a very thin layer of red on top of clear, and they can acid etch away. You know we use the same technique like the star you see on the right hand side of the Judson window. Um, that technique's used where the lamb is, and and then it's also combined with enamel paints on on clear glass. So you notice here there's no lead lines or anything like that. But I kind of show you this this kind of juxtaposition between the two um, styles. Uh, and to me, it seems ironic for a West Coast studio where you think of California and, and contemporary things. We're actually doing very a lot of traditional work, and and in Germany, it's very uh, very contemporary. But for Judson, that goes way back. And I and I start with uh, kind of our patriarch, William Lee's Judson, who came to Los Angeles in um, 1893. He was born in England. Uh, he came to to Los Angeles from Chicago. And he was there in 1890, kind of getting ready for the World's Fair. The, the, the Columbia Exhibition in 1893 was kind of a major, one of the most uh, largest uh, fairs in the United States. And he was there helping kind of set up the art world. But he had to find a warm place to die, basically. He, he, he went to his doctor in 1893, and um, he said, you know, go find a warm place, you know, to live out your days. Um, well, he didn't die until 1928. So I like to say that's what California weather does for you. Um, he was primarily a painter, and he did a lot of portraits, but he was also a plein air painter, uh, which meant uh, he painted outside. And this is the Arroyo Seco, and this is where he came when he um, moved to Los Angeles, and he fell in love with the Arroyo, like, like so many painters did at that time. And um, you can see that bridge there is, is um, I believe, the Holly Street Bridge. It's a different bridge now, but and if you go over that hill on the right-hand side, you'd end up at the, at the Rose Bowl. So he did a lot of painting in the Arroyo. Um, he lived on the Arroyo. That's his house on the left-hand side that you see there. So this is a photo taking, taken from the, the bed of the Arroyo Seco, which now unfortunately is the 110 freeway. But on the left-hand side, you see his house, uh, which the, with the kind of turret or tower there at the top, and that's Los Angeles. And if you take that bridge over to the right, you'd end up in South Pasadena, and eventually Pasadena. And, and you can see the San Gabriel's up on the far right. So he had a great spot and it was for him affordable. He said he couldn't live, afford to live in Pasadena. So he found this great place in, in what was called Garvanza or the Highland Park area of, of Northeast Los Angeles. And he, he was in that turret all the time painting and, and um, really kind of uh, uh, using as much daylight as he, can, as he could to paint. Now, standing almost at his house, this was the view looking northeast. And so this is the, the red car, which ran right next to his house. So this is looking northeast, uh, the bridge that now is uh, the York Street Bridge. So if you're familiar with the area, this is the York Street, uh, where the York Street Bridge is, uh, looking at South Pasadena. And the red car basically ran from, from Pasadena down to, to downtown Los Angeles, and I, and I think a little bit further. And then you can see the, the Santa Fe train train behind there. And right next to his house, Judson built this building. And um, Judson was um, an early, um, you know, one of the first art professors in the Los Angeles area. And um, he uh, started teaching downtown Los Angeles and then in 1900 built this building with, uh, which became the School of Fine Arts for USC and he became its first dean. And, and um, he was a great candidate because he, he had university teaching experience when he lived in Canada, kind of his former life. Um, and he was also a Methodist, right? And the USC, uh, univer the university was, was uh, the fighting Methodist at that time. So it kind of, he kind of fit the bill. And um, so he became the first dean. He, he, you know, this was kind of the art center of um, Los Angeles at that time. He was also the, the president of what was called the Royal Guild of Fellow Crafters. And um, so not only was it the art school, but it was the headquarters of the guild of, uh, cause this was the kind of the, the epicenter of the arts and crafts movement in, in um, Los Angeles. And um, the Royal Craftsman was their 
uh, publication, uh, kind of the answer to Stickley's The Craftsman uh, publication. Um, but they were better crafters than they were publishers because they didn't get past this volume, volume one, number one. So this is the one and only. The building burned down in 1910. It was, it was rebuilt almost um, immediately. It was designed by uh, the architects Train and Williams, which were um, kind of local uh, Los Angeles architects um, that were uh, lived very close to this, this building and were, were good friends with Judson. It remained the school um, here. Uh, the dormitories, uh, women's dormitories actually would have been on the upper right hand side there. It was the it remained the school and the headquarters um, of the Royal Guild, at least until 1920. Here's an early shot of uh, the USC art students, which is kind of fun to see. And Judson also uh, was helped his sons found the Judson Studios. And so these are three of Judson's sons. So not only did he found the USC School of Fine Arts, the Royal Guild, but also the Judson Studios. And so um, rather than coming out to, to live out his days, he, he actually got very busy. And um, that's my great grandfather that you see in the middle there with the great mustache. And uh, his name was um, Walter. And in the front is Paul and in the back is Lionel. And they're sitting in that building, actually that's before the fire. Um, but um, they started a company in 1897. This is, uh, the first earliest commission that we've ever seen was found in this building. And when I was researching the book, you know, it was amazing to see because um, before Judson became Judson Studios, it was called the Colonial Art Glass Company. And so in 1897, um, they started this company and uh, Phineas Mansion was built. It's right there in Orange Grove, if you can believe it. And um, unfortunately this building burned down and um, Phineas Mansion is now uh, what we know as the uh, Pasadena Museum of History. And these photos I, uh, were provided to us from the Pasadena Museum of History. It was so great. And when they called one day and showed up and said, hey, we've got these amazing photos. And so it was very exciting to see. And so you see at the top of the, um, at the top of that kind of atrium there, you see the window and that's it uh, looking from, from down below. So um, a little bit later, the uh, Judson did this window. It's for the Abbey San Encino, which is um, was built by Clyde Brown. You can see the CB down there in the bottom right. And Clyde was a printer. And so he um, commissioned this window in exchange for some printing materials that uh, Judson used for, for marketing purposes. Another early project was um, at the Inglewood Mausoleum. And this is what we kind of know as opalescent glass uh, commonly associated with the American art glass movement. Um, most of you know Tiffany, and you know, this is kind of the epitome of a, a, the style that Tiffany worked in and Lafarge and some uh, other studios in, in the, um, the Northeast, a very kind of a American style. But these are very elegant, beautiful, and simple windows um, that are still, still there today. Another kind of monument uh, window uh, at the Natural History Museum in, um, La in Los Angeles. And this would have been the fine, art, fine arts building when it was originally built. And um, the dome is approximately, I think 30, 35 feet in diameter. And um, we actually were, uh, my brother led up the restoration of this, this uh, window in, in the early 2000s. Um, Judson also did the globe on top of the, what are the three muses there, the sculpture you see at the bottom. and. The sculpture was done um, by Julia Bracken Went, who is the wife of William Went, who is a, a, also a plein air painter and, and um, good friend of, of William Lee's Judson. So, you know, what was excited about, you know, studying some of these early projects on the book is there were, you know, these kind of, uh, you know, thinking about the history and where these places were and, you know, some surprises. This one actually surprised. Um, when uh, Stephanie and I were kind of looking into this and realized, wait, that, that globe is a, is a Judson piece. I didn't, I, I never knew that growing up. And so it was kind of fun to see. And this is beautiful, this uh, kind of chandelier hanging in the rotunda around these amazing murals. And um, this is looking up at it. And you can see kind of the, um, uh, the uh, zodiac symbols around, and that this piece, this sculpture, is actually done by the same artist who did the um, the Atlas Shrugged in Rockefeller Center. 
So it's a, a very kind of interesting uh, connection and a beautiful piece. It's still there. So if you if you haven't seen it in the library, it's it's worth a visit. A little bit later in the twenties. Uh, this is All Saints Pasadena, and, and uh, this piece was done by Judson by an artist named Frederick Wilson. And Frederick Wilson designed the transept windows in All Saints Church as well, um, but he did them for Tiffany Studios. And um, Frederick Wilson was uh, Tiffany's lead liturgical designer for a number of years until he came out in the, I think it was the early 20s, to uh, install some mosaics in downtown Los Angeles. And it was in December. And so he, you know, kind of came and saw the weather and said, you know, why, why are we not living out here? So anyway, he sent his family. He bought a house just around the corner, actually, from Judson Studios and, and did a lot of commissioned work for Judson and another local company called um, LA Art Glass. Uh, Judson Studios also did the windows for um, the Hollyhock House, Frank Lloyd Wright's Hollyhock House. And um, these windows, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright commissioned just local stained glass artists generally for his his projects. And so Judson did these windows early on and it's they're really beautiful. Again, we've we've done some restoration work on these windows as well. Uh, and they're still restoring the house and recently restored the, the kind of the west side of the house, which looks really amazing. Judson also did um, the Ennis um, house windows and, and the attribution of these is a little foggier. Um, because Frank Lloyd Wright was fired from this job. And so um, uh, it's, we believe that you know, Judson probably, someone from Judson probably designed these windows with some influence of some uh, Chicago studios. And um, these windows have also been uh, restored recently. And uh, the view from the house, obviously, if you haven't been up there, is really spectacular. And um, so it's, it's uh, kind of an interesting... Um, uh, story just simply because, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright did everything right in his houses and, and these windows can't, can't be attributed to him. So there's still a little mystery to that, but, um, in two, 20, 2018, we were invited to, um, look at the windows at Unity Temple in Oak Park, which, um, uh, completely, the whole building went over a complete restoration and, uh, it was really, you know, uh, an honor and a privilege to work on these windows as well. Judson did not did the, do them originally. Um, they were probably done by Jeannie and Hilgart in Chicago, although I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but we went to Oak Park. We removed all of the windows. They'd been restored over the years. There was um, definitely, uh, definitely a lot of um, kind of repairs over the years that um, really – uh, it was decided that these windows had to completely be, come apart and then re, be recamed. Um, uh, and it, it, they, use, they use zinc. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright liked to use zinc instead of lead. And right as we got this contract, the, the zinc manufacturer went out of business. And so um, we kind of went on this scramble to find zinc to, to replace, which was, was not an easy task. Um, and we also had to find uh, glass, replacement glass, that uh, we went to – various um, manufacturers of ours to, to find that um, replacement glass. And this is the, these are some of the restored images. It's a beautiful space. This is the school next to the temple. Um, and then the, in the depression age, the, um, a lot of the commissions came from mausoleums and we have a whole chapter on mausoleums um, and uh, because the churches basically couldn't, couldn't raise the money anymore. This is the Golden West Cemetery uh, Mausoleum. This is not the Inglewood one that I showed you earlier. Um, and they have these Ameri amazing kind of uh, California landscapes. That's El Capitan there. And uh, the, the LA Memorial Branch also kind of a uh, uh, depression era. This is uh, in memory of all the uh, soldiers that went to LA high school that um, f uh, died in the war and um, some beautiful kind of uh, medallions in there. World War, uh, World War II, basically the, the company shut down. There was, I think, three um, um, people working in the studio. My grandfather went to Lockheed and worked for Lockheed for a number of years and then came back. And uh, this was the typical work that kind of came in the 50s and 60s and was a boom. You know, there was, there was kind of this massive boom, not like just like the city of L.A., massive growth. Um, the neo-Gothic style, I think, was, can be attributed to GIs coming back from Europe as well as um, you know, a lot of these buildings, like this one, for example, St. James in South Pass, was built in 1907, 
they didn't commission their windows until the 1950s. So you see a lot of these um, kind of neo-Gothic styles uh, in that time. Also the military commissions, um, there's quite a few military commissions. This is one of my grandfather's favorites. So you see it at night. Um, it's really beautiful, uh, an amazing design. This is it from the inside. And we get to actually, uh, this, this building is gonna go under a complete renovation starting in the fall. So we'll be pulling out, I think there's over 2,200 panels we'll be pulling out. And um, so uh, in the book, there's, there's also another uh, a good number of uh, military commissions that we show as well. And then in the 70s, I always kind of get a kick out of showing this, you know, the Vegas, uh, you know, little Vegas flair. And, um, you know, we noticed then looking at my uh, kind of my father's chapter, you know, he did a lot of uh, domes. And so domes were kind of uh, the thing then. This was the largest barrel dome in the in the country at the time. It was about, I'd say, maybe 16 feet tall, maybe 30 feet wide and, and maybe um, 80 or 90 feet long. And uh, was completely suspended because they were still doing nuclear testing in Nevada at that time. So so um, it needed to be able to move. So they had to engineer a frame that actually could shift with those, those reverberations. In the 80s, this is kind of um, when I started getting involved. I actually was in high school cutting glass for this project. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I talk about in the book kind of working for my dad. And this is uh, one of my dad's uh, favorite projects that he did. It was kind of a, a, a fairly large project at multi years. And, um, you know, working on these, it was still, you know, Judson's still kind of doing a lot of traditional work. You know, at the same time, uh, I was looking at work like this. So this is Schaffrath's work in Germany. And the Germans, after the war, like I was saying, we, you know, the U.S. is a lot of neo-Gothic neo work in Germany, very contemporary. And they kind of went off on a totally different tangent and kind of led the way in terms of design. And even as recently as 2013, what, have, what was happening is American artists, so Guy Kemper's actually from Kentucky, was going to Germany to get commissions like these made. So these are, there are these really talented artists working in the United States and doing, you know, public art. This is a public art project, um, secular work. Um, but they were, they were going to, to Germany to get their work done because the Germans are so good. You know, I mentioned the flash glass earlier. This is a kind of an example of a blue flash glass where the acid etching takes away the blue to leave some of the clear. And they, they use these enamel paints to do these great, great big jobs. Um, well, we were doing work like this. So about the same time, Judson was doing these super um, kind of traditional draws, which I loved. You know, I really enjoyed doing them. Um, I had found a young artist, Tim Carey, who uh, was a great painter and really fell in love with, with working in stained glass. And this is, um, you know, he'd studied glass painting. And so we really kind of got into it. And it opened up projects like this for us. And uh, so this is down at the USC Crusoe Catholic Center. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's worth a trip. Um, these windows are about uh, 12 feet wide by 26 feet tall. And um, this was a, a project that um, was you know, really kind of instrumental in, in changing uh, the studio just simply because of the size of it. And it really pushed us in a lot of ways. Um, this is the rose window there. Um, and so two important things. One is this, uh, we were really kind of focusing on collaborations. And so this is a Gail Roski design that she gave us a watercolor and we worked with her to, to uh, do these flowers um, in fused glass, which I'll be coming into fused glass in a minute. But um, these are all native California flowers that she took from the other windows um, to incorporate into the rose window. The second thing, the most important thing was that we started designing on the computer. So you see the kind of the Wacom tablet and Tim's actually drawing directly on that tablet. This was an extremely kind of major shift. It was really hard for me to get the designers to do this. Um, but what it did is it, it allowed us to sketch. So you see the figures there in that on the computer screen. Um, we could sketch these out. We could model these figures with, with take digital shots of them, drop the digital shots on top of these figures and then draw our sketch on top of those, those photographs. So that did two things for us. That, saved us a ton of time on any kind of changes um, in the design process. And it also allowed us to create our full-size cartoons, which you see on the wall there, that's a full-size cartoon, the actual size of the panel um, through the computer. So in the past that would have been done by, by hand and actually hand drawn, um, but the computer allowed us to, um, to actually uh, print these out. So we could spend more of our time painting on the glass, which you see on the light table there, um, the, 
the glass painting is probably the most expensive process. And so if we could eliminate a lot of the design time and the full size cartooning, we could really focus on the glass painting. And so that was really uh, a breakthrough for us and exciting for us because the glass painting is the most interesting part, I think, of the, of the process there. Okay, so then we had, um, this is kind of a, a, the next phase of, of my talk. And um, this is, I call it the phone call because we got a, a phone call one day uh, Tim, my artist, picked it up, and he got a, you know, on the other line was an architect. She said, you know, hey, you know, we're, we're you know, building this church, and we want to know how big you can make a stained glass window. Oh, that's, a, that's always a great question to get, right? And um, so this, this is kind of um, leading into chapter 10 and 11 of the book where we kind of shift gears and really change, change things because this job uh, was really a massive project, right? So when it was originally designed, it was uh, about 40 feet tall by 100 feet wide. And this is the placeholder conceptual design that they gave us early on. And um, so we had to kind of figure out how to design something in this massive space, right? And so they did uh, an international search and it came down to these two studios. So <laughs> it was really amazing to think like, wow, so, uh, you know, if the committee has selected these two studios and these two artists as kind of the finalists, that, that committee's got to be split. And so we, we figured as, you know, having specialized in traditional work, it'd be easier for us to lead towards the contemporary than the contemporary folks to come towards the traditional. And we knew there were some, some traditionalists on the committee. So we created um, this design and, and this was based off of the narrative that the, the, the pastor gave us, Pastor Adam um, Hamilton. And on the left is the Garden of Eden. In the center is the Resurrection Garden. And on the right, the Church of, uh, sorry, the, the um, Garden of Revelation. And, you know, the resurrected Christ there, the main figure, because it's, it was the Church of the Resurrection. And so that was kind of their, their primary focus. So this is, the, this is the design that actually got us um, the uh, kind of the, the commission, at least initially. And this is where it ended up. So after uh, months and months of design and working with the pastor, this is what um, the window ended up being. And this is what got approved. And so we dropped it into place and we um, kind of thought, wow, okay, this, this is, um, you yeah, this is a typical school bus, right? And it's uh, it, we, to give you a sense of the, the scale of what we, we'd gotten ourselves into. And, um, you know, really we had designed something because we, we pushed ourselves to create something that was, you know, figurative and, and narrative, but also conceptual as well. I mean, um, very contemporary we designed something we didn't know exactly how to make. So Tim and I kind of um, scratched our heads. And then one day Tim saw an announcement that um, uh, a guy named Narcissus Quagliata was, was giving a class. And this is Narcissus' work. And so we thought, wow, well, the guy who made this can help us, right? It's, it's a bit of a stretch, but this is a 7,000 square foot dome. So it was twice the size of, of the window that we were, we were working on for Kansas City. And so not only, you know, did we know that he worked in the figurative realm, but he also could handle a large project. So we convinced him to come down and I'll introduce you to Narcissus. So this is Narcissus. I'm going to, I'm going to put this talk in a little bit of a bracket here. And this is a part of the book too, that is kind of important and historically significant. And um, I got his permission to show this picture, but I, I, I laughed at this picture because that's Narcissus on the right. And the guy just, next to him that he's leaning on, you may know, and that's Dale Chihuly. And so most of us know Dale Chihuly, um, and maybe not like this, but um, these are the early days. And you know, Dale Chihuly started Pilchuck Glass School. And Pilchuck is kind of like the, kind of the school for, for hot, what we call hot glass, which is glass blowing, right? And so um, Dale you know, started, this is another early picture of Dale Chihuly, which is great. I, Narcissus loaned me this picture and you can see him blowing the glass. You see the glass on the right-hand side there. This is before the eye patch, of course. And Dale did a lot of glass blowing in 3D work, right? So if you think of hot glass, hot glass is for blowing glass. But they also taught stained glass and that was Narcissus was the primary teacher and Dale Chihuly always invited Narcissus to come teach. Um, this is some of uh, Narcissus' early work. And you can kind of see he, he kind of you know, mixing all of these colors and creating kind of like this symphony of color. And what he did is that he realized, wow, if these guys are blowing glass, I can control maybe design the, the effects that I want directly in the glass, right? And so on the left, you see him 
uh, designing a, uh, a rondelle uh, to, to, to be blown, right? So rondelles are blown at the end of blowpipes. And so on the right-hand side, he's putting glass on what's called a marver, which is a very hot, basically, table that um, he'd spread the glass onto the marver. Um, they'd take the gather of glass, which is the real molten glass on the end of a blowpipe. He'd roll it onto that glass. He'd get them to blow um, these, these um, rondelles for him, and then he could incorporate those into his stained glass. So, you know, he was really a two-dimensional artist. He wasn't a three-dimensional artist, but he saw some kind of promise in there. So he started using the rondelles, but really what he really wanted was these bits of color, right? This movement in the glass that he could cut up and, and piece together and put into his his windows. You see, you see the kind of on the left hand side there those shapes that I just showed you. The problem was it was super complicated and difficult to make. So I don't know if you can see kind of the shiny lines there on the table in between the glass. That's all leading. And that if you know anything about making stained glass, that is totally insane. Like you you look at that and you say that is that's extremely difficult to do. And so it was a very uh, practically, this was a very difficult thing to do to be able to make the panels um, with these crazy lead lines and crazy glass, right? So he went to Bullseye Glass, um, which was started in 1974. And this is what we refer to as warm glass or kiln-formed glass. And this is uh, a little bit different from, from glass blowing where kiln-formed glass is actually putting glass in a kiln. And some of the early experiments that Narcissus did was to take the glass put it on a flat sheet and then stick it into the, the, the oven. And they could do this because bullseye had come up a way with a, a way to create their glass to be compatible. So um, most stained glass that you see now, if you cut it up and stick it in a kiln, it wouldn't, it would stress itself out and, and crack. But bullseye created all of their colors to be compatible. So when you heated them up in a kiln and, and played around with them, this is like I said, very early on where that glass is super hot, you see, and he's kind of manipulating it with that stick to create some, this is the very first one. So this is 1993 and this is a head. So you can see, I don't know if you can see the shoulders there kind of towards the bottom and then kind of a head, you know, this kind of abstracted head. And so that was kind of an early test. And he went back down to the Bay Area and worked with a guy named David Ruth. And David Ruth is a, a kiln uh, casting or kiln forming artist. And uh, so there you see inside of the kiln, this molten glass and that's the head from that series. And so you see it's a little bit more sophisticated. And um, so even just a year later, he's, he's Narcissus is kind of coming up with this. And then this piece in 1995, which really kind of shows the promise of, of fused or kiln formed glass in kind of a, a larger uh, setting and, and even an architectural one. So by looking at Narcissus, we knew who he was and we knew what he did. Um, and we thought, wow, if we can do this, you know, you see that piece in 1999, this is what he started doing in 2011 after he did the dome that I showed you earlier. He started exploring with the figure and, and he realized, well, if I can add paint and paint into the figures, I can really take advantage of the glass and incorporating the figure. And that's what really, I, th I think, intrigued Tim and I the most when we started looking at Narcissus for help. So Tim went up to Denver. He took a class. This is Narcissus today, you know, in normal, no more clothes. <laughs> um, and uh, working uh, in, in Denver and, and teaching the classes, the class that, that Tim took, they hit it off. We convinced him to come down to Los Angeles and say, look, hey, you know, look at our design. We're thinking about fusing this thing. What do you think? And so we put him to work immediately in our studio. He started doing a lot of tests and then realized, look, you've, we've got to go up to Bullseye. And this is um, Dan Shore. He's the owner of Bullseye Glass. And so we went up to Bullseye and said, look, we're, we're really interested in Kind of moving this into the stained glass realm can you help us and so uh tim and narcissus stayed up there and they made the first panel of kansas this was the very first panel we made and we saw some real promise so you can imagine we got all of those colors combined with the painting we realized okay this this is really something that we can uh run with the problem was is we're in a you know historic monument right and, and kiln forming glass requires kilns and electricity and we didn't really have a lot of time to make this window. And so, um, so that led us to then make the decision to expand to a second facility. And so you see that wall of glass on the left-hand side, that's now the what we call Judson Studios East or 143. And on the right, interestingly enough, is, is Bullseye's uh, Glasses Resource Center. And so the idea was you know, to kind of 
create kind of a, a center of glass and really kind of um, be able to to push the limits. And so once we got that facility, Tim and, and Narcissus really kind of went to work because we had to make 161 panels in less than a year, um, four by five feet each panel. And so um, here you see them fritting and fritting is an interesting material. So like I said, Bullseye created frit to really um, create different effects on the glass. So this is ground up glass basically. And you can kind of see how some of it's finer, some of it's a little more almost like a, a gravel. And um, each of these different sizes and colors of frit are compatible with all of their sheet glass. So what it allows us to do is, is to create transitions of color with these frits um, to really uh, get the effects that we were trying to get here. And so let me just show you kind of an example. And I use the lion because I've shown you a lion already, right? So here's a traditional painted lion and here's a lion that's been fused. And so what we were able to do just as an example is we would take a base sheet of clear glass, bullseye clear glass, uh, Tim would paint on it. So here you see the eyes of the line, you see the kind of the curved line in the center, which was pieces. And we were gonna lead these panels. Um, and then we put on what we call descriptive glass. So you see the colored glass here that um, would be laid out um, on top of the painting. And then we could apply the frit for these transitions. And the tricky thing about frit is that frit kind of hides what you're working on. And so that's when it gets really kind of tricky, but it creates these amazing effects, right? So you imagine all the detail that's in that eye. And pull out a little bit and you can see this. So that, that panel right there is four by five feet. And you see the lead lines because like I mentioned earlier, there were some traditionalists on the committee that wanted to, to make these panels with lead. Um, in theory, we could have made these four by five panels in one piece, but for practical purposes with, a, with the speed that we we're trying to do, if we needed to change something out, it was easier to do when we had uh, smaller pieces to work with. The other kind of just show you a couple of spots here in the window, uh, the galaxy we did, and that's taking um, the frit and kind of working a little bit backwards. So Narcissus is putting the frit down in the kiln. So you see those, those are, that's frit that's been fired overnight and it's in the kiln. He's getting ready to pull it out. And um, he's created almost like these big brush strokes, right? And so here, if you take that frit and you lay it out, um, then we could uh, use it, combine it with more cut glass and more frit to get these amazing effects. So if you think about that, that's, that's dozens of colors in a very small amount of space. And that's like a piece there that kind of shows you what, what frit can do. And we use this, throughout the whole window. It was just really amazing. You know, it was like this experiment of 161 panels to be able to play with frit and fused glass. And then lastly, just the really, you know, so important was this face of Christ and was the most difficult panel that, that, we, that we made. You see the glass on the right-hand side. So we were actually making these, these core pieces of glass that they were then taking and cutting and assembling you can see here these these effects. So we were creating pieces that were then laid out on top of the paint, and it was almost like a mosaic. And uh, these pieces laid all together, combined with paint, we added frit to come without with the face. And the face, I think, is is probably the most important piece in the whole window. And here you can kind of see the scale. This is after our first installation. We did all the installation, and we got it just in time for Easter. So. They were very happy with with that, and so, so for me, you know, as as Tim and Narcissus really focused on that project, for me and what it was really kind of the inspiration of this book in a way was like, well, where do we go from here? You know, like this this thinking about the future made me think about the past, and um, you know, I I was really felt excited about what we were able to do and uh, some of the options that we had, and so we kept Narcissus around, or he he was excited about sticking around a little bit, and he did design this for residents down in Newport Beach. This was recently um, installed. We haven't actually, we still need to do some more photographs. Um, but Narcissus you know, is continuing to kind of push the element. This is the only dome that he's ever made that's completely fused glass. And um, so it's dimensional as well. So the, the top of it goes up and then in the center where the flower is comes down. And so it's this really amazing kind of effect when you walk in. The other thing that I was very excited about, what we wanted to do was, was to reach out to artists. And some of the first artists that really were excited about working with us in glass 
or your muralist, you know, and street street artist. Here's David Flores with his piece called The Street Artist. It was actually shown in a in a very traditional gallery up in Santa Barbara in 2018. You see it on the right hand side there. And we also went out to, to artists around town. This is uh, Amir Fala actually lives up the street from the studio. And Amir, uh, this is actually uh, kind of a self-portrait, which is an interesting piece. So you look at that piece right there, that's probably, there's probably at least 200 pieces of glass in there. And it would be fu fused into one single piece. And we even used little, what we call frit balls that were fused on top of the, the sock monkey there to give it texture. And Amir came in and did a little bit of painting on it. And that's the panel there that then showed in his gallery and, and sold. And it did so well, he, he made another one. This is another Amir piece. So working with artists in galleries, I think is really uh, you know important. Public art. So this is Michael Davis, a, a fairly well-known public artist in, in Southern California. And this is a piece that he put together um, that's in a, an apartment complex. And at night, it's really beautiful. It's like this box of, of glass. It's really kind of amazing next to that mosaic. An abstract artist, Sarah Kane, we, we worked with her. She had a, a public art commission at the San Francisco airport. Here she's working with Reed, one of our artists in the studio. And she did a, a, this 150 foot wall of glass at SFO. Um, these are, this is about 10 feet tall. And this is the, the new um, uh, uh, hotel. I think this is the Hyatt and that's the, the check-in for it there. Artists like James Jean, James really kind of took to it. He, he did this in 2017. This, actually went to uh, Japan and was exhibited in Japan at the Mirakami Gallery. And he got so excited, he, he kind of started working in three, you know, we, we talked a lot about glass and kind of what, where to go. And so he wanted to create a three-dimensional piece. And that's the piece there. And that was um, extremely difficult to do, but that's all fused glass combined with some painting, some of the traditional painting. And that's, those are, that's a composite of the panels um, put together. And it's about, uh, that piece is about eight feet tall. And James's next project, he's super, we're super excited. We just started working on this. Uh, he's calling the Pagoda. And it's, um, it's about um, 18 feet wide by about 14 feet tall. And you're going you're gonna to be able to walk into it and look up. So at day, when you walk in and look out through it, it's going to be amazing. And then at night, uh, we hope to have this in a place where we haven't found a home yet for it. But uh, hope to, it's, it's just going to be a beacon uh, at night, you know, uh, light lighted and hopefully seen from, from very far away. So one of the things in talking with narcissists we really kind of needed to do and realized um, we needed to focus on was, was training our folks, right? Our, our staff are super talented, um, but they've kind of come to uh, their profession through a very traditional means of stained glass. And so we wanted to train them to really think about working in glass in a different way. Because I like to say fusing is a very easy thing to do but it's an extremely hard thing to do well. And um, so, uh, especially when there's not a lot of two-dimensional fused glass, we really kind of had to figure out, well, how do, we, how do we go about training our folks? And so what we did is we, we gave them each a, a painting, I'll show you in a second, and we, we set them up in our studio. That's our new studio there, you can see. And all the frit jars, they're all kind of working on their separate projects. But I went to my friend Peter Adams at the California Art Club and I said, Peter, I think it would be really amazing to see planar paintings um, in fused glass. And so he, he loved the idea. And we um, kind of uh, uh, worked together to, to find some artists that were willing to work with us. And we assigned a painting to each of our, our um, artists. Um, in this case, we had Matt and Quentin working on these. And you see them working on them. And then the, that was the finished product that they came up with. And we picked very four very different paintings that we wanted the artists to look at so that our, our, our designers to look at because we wanted them to think about it very differently and think about it as a, as a fused project as opposed to a traditional stained glass one. And Reed did this kind of amazing, you see a lot of the pre-made glass that you see that's already on there and he's putting some frit on it. And here's this kind of abstract plein air painting which is exciting to see kind of come to life. Stephen Curry's painting. And again, you see how small that is. So we were converting these paintings, this nine, this 11 inch by nine inch painting into a um, basically a almost six, six foot by six foot um, piece. Robin Purcell's piece, again, fairly small, 14 by 14. 
And this is Andrea's piece. She used a lot of what we call lace glass. So you see some of the fused glass with the clear holes shining through, and she can fill that with frit to create these kind of amazing effects. And all together, here they are in the studio. Unfortunately, our, our frames are behind them, but they're really beautiful the way the light's coming in. And these were actually commissioned by um, Inglewood Mausoleum. So we're super excited because they're gonna be in the same building as these windows that I showed you earlier. And so it's kind of fun to see you know, just over 100 years later, uh, the Judson windows that were made here and then uh, what we're working on for them now. And, you know, the other thing I think I'm so excited about working with other artists is like the, in my research and in, in the research in the book and research for fused glass, I looked to see like, why hadn't this been done before? And I, you know, came across all of these artists, these fairly famous artists that had worked in stained glass. And I thought, wow, if these, think about if these artists could have worked in fused glass, what they would have done. And um, even as recently as, as last year, I believe it was a year or two years ago, David Hockney did this window for Westminster Abbey. And, you know, it's an interesting window. And I'm so happy that, you know, one of the most famous artists in the world is working in stained glass. But I think, wow, if he would have, if he would have fused this window, what, what it could have been, you know? And I think part of it is, you know, you're a little conservative working in Westminster Abbey with the queen looking over your shoulder. But um, as interesting as this window is in, in, in England, you know, I, re I refer back to this window that Narcissus did for Grace Cathedral in, in San Francisco. And I think, wow, this is the California spirit. And I think, you know, it's very exciting to see the possibilities that we have with working in fused glass um, with artists and, and kind of turning the page and looking towards the future. So that's a little snapshot of the book. I want to thank you all really for being here. It's, I'm so sorry to miss so many of you at our, at our book launch. Um, I want to thank Romans and I want to thank um, Angel City Press for, for being so supportive of us. Thank you to Steffi for, for you know, kind of working through all this. This was a lot of work. This book it took us a little over four years to, to put together. And um, I'm hoping that you all have some questions for me. At this point they do they do <laughs> uh, uh you uh folks if you still like to there is the ask a question down there at the bottom um because uh some of the stuff we may, may not get to but um if you want to have one in there uh definitely put them in there now um thank you for the presentation david like just fascinating fascinating stuff overall oh, great thank and, you um yeah and uh we definitely have some questions from people um so um Carla St. Romain asked uh, if you could please give a few insights about the project to restore the Unity Temple glass. Yeah, so I touched on that a little bit and, and um, Unity Temple was um, a very touchy one, you know, because Frank Lloyd Wright is such a kind of a, a treasure, his, you know, architecturally and also in his stained glass designs. And so um, uh, when the decision was made to completely rezinc all of those windows, it, it gave us the advantage to really kind of take these windows apart, you know, get everything lined up the way I think Frank Wright intended. Um, uh, we had to search for glass all over the country. Like I said, uh, the, our zinc manufacturer went out of business almost as soon as we signed the contract. And so uh, luckily another company in Canada bought all the machinery from our supplier and revamped it and got it up and running, but it, it definitely ended into our time. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful, if you if you are in the Chicago area and are a Franklin Wright fan, it's a must see now because the restoration project they did on the whole building is really spectacular. Awesome. Yeah, I will apologize ahead of time if I do ask some questions that I think you may have covered because I yeah. was trying to like, as you were going, I'm like, oh my gosh, I probably should have written, <laughs> yeah, written down all the, there, all, so. the different <laughs> one, all the different ones he's mentioning because I'm like, wait, did, as I look at these questions, I'm like, did he mention that one? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so my apologies ahead of time. <laughs> um, so um, Brian Allen Baker uh, asked, uh, will art glass make a comeback in domestic architecture? If so, what applications? Yeah, you know, that's that's a really interesting question. And we do do a lot of actually um, uh, residential work. And, and um, you know, I think I think there's two things. There's two two things, I think. One is that um, architecture now, and this, this is maybe beyond just residential work, but I think people are not afraid of color anymore, right? I think there is this long period where so much architecture was just gray and kind of simple and clean lines. And now I think people are are returning to color. And so there's kind of this resurgence in glass because it's, 
you know, such a beautiful medium uh, and colorful. Um, and secondly, what I think where I see we see a lot of kind of interesting glass in, in homes and things is, um, you know, I think that I think there's a demand for for the handmade. You know, I think we're we're so surrounded even now. Yeah, you know, we're here we are on a computer. Uh, you know, we're we're constantly living in a digital world. Uh, we want to surround our, our, ourselves with things that are handmade, that are made of natural materials and that kind of thing. And glass is such a such a great, you know, stained glass is such a great um, uh, part of that. You know, I think, you know, it's such a long tradition of, of uh, really kind of creating personal expression in your house, um, but also, you know, kind of giving it your own signature, but also living with something that's kind of warm. And, and you know, I think now we've all kind of gotten a new appreciation for our home. So I think, I think we'll see that uh, continue. Well, eventually, I'll ask you to do something. Uh, one of our I get a big giant house that that is requiring of that. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, uh, did you ever? Uh, this is from uh, Peter H. Um, he asked, uh, "Did you ever work with Edith and Isabel Pitsek and their stained glass windows for the Catholic Church?" Yeah, no, we we um, have worked on Pisic windows. We didn't necessarily work with the Pisic sisters. They have their own studio. And um, they did actually the majority of Catholic work in Southern California in the, I think starting in the late 50s up until the 90s and um, uh, even into the 2000s, I think. So uh, they were more competitors than they were collaborators. So, uh, you know, but they uh, had a very interesting kind of uh, career and um, I love their, I love their work. Excellent. Uh, let's see, uh, Ellen uh, Dinerman asked, uh, can you explain the actual process of painting enamel paints on glass? Yeah, so um, maybe I wasn't super clear. So there's, there's um, traditional painting has what we call vitreous paint. So vitreous paint is like ground up glass. And I, what I was trying to show, for example, when I was showing the lions of a traditional painted mm. lion, when you paint the eyes on the lion and the mane, that's vitreous uh, paint. When I was showing, for example, the lamb window that was done by um, Scott Parsons and Derricks, a lot of the colors were uh, enamel paints, meaning colored paints. So generally in traditional stained glass, you get the color from the glass. What, what the Germans are so good at is, is making it look like, they're combining kind of some of the traditional glass with colored enamels on clear glass. So they can, they can paint float glass with colored enamel glass Generally, they airbrush it on so they can airbrush uh, colored enamels onto clear glass to make it look like stained glass. Uh, so okay. I hope that answers that question um, about the enamel paints. Uh, yeah, I think. You know, because be. the, the distinction I'm trying to make and uh, what I hope people will go away with is the fact that what we're doing is we're actually manipulating glass. Like we're, we're able to work with colored glass in the glass itself. Whereas you know, uh, the the a lot of the German studios work with surface treatments, right? So they're using flash glass, which I described with with using acid to eat away a color to get to another color, or using colored enamels to paint on the surface of the glass. So what we really like and what we're so excited about the fusing glass is that it's uh, manipulation of the glass itself and not just the surface of the glass. So. Um, we see a lot of advantages to that, not only to kind of the ability as a painter, for example, to look at glass, but also the longevity. If you think about, you know, glass is a very stable, I mean, other than, you know, smashing it, glass is a very stable material that, you know, lasts for, you know, you think about cathedrals that are thousands of years old, um, still have their stained glass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why people still are in awe of them. I think there's a yeah, big yeah. I mean, it still like it still resonates. Yeah, I mean, stained glass <laughs> has this kind of almost spiritual connection, and and um, you know because it's natural light, right? I, as I speak, as I'm kind of getting blown out by light, but um, <laughs> the uh, the idea of having natural light coming through colored glass is really kind of uh, you know just a, an effect you can't get any other way. Um. Uh, David Palmer had a question, and I know I know you talked a lot about you know, the different projects that you were getting that were kind of escalating in size and scope. And yeah. um, uh, so uh, David said, uh, 
first off, he said, the work you're doing in fused glass is amazing. Uh, he said, what is the size limit of a panel that, be, that can be created without the need of letting? Yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, the panels that we did, for example, at um, uh, the can on the Kansas project were uh, uh, four by five feet, and they were leaded by choice. You know, the the, the they wanted a, a little, somewhat of a traditional feel to them, um, but those could have been made in, in a single piece. Uh, the largest, you know, the largest piece that you can make in fused glass really depends on the size of your kiln, and um, we have the largest kilns that we have now in our new facility are four by eight feet. So the largest panels that we've made are, are four by eight feet, basically, is I guess the simple answer to that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had uh, a few people ask about the uh, exhibit at Forest Lawn, um, which is somebody in the comments, I think, had answered is still running. Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And, and um, we're very excited about this. Um, James Fishburne, the curator at the Forest Lawn Museum, mm -hmm. have been working on a stained glass yes. exhibit. And um, yeah, I see James. James popped up. James has done yeah, exactly <laughs> to, um, to put together really kind of a, a little bit of a kind of embodiment of this pro of this talk of of showing the historic uh, stained glass of Judson Studios and also the contemporary work that we're doing. So, mm. and he's got panels in that in that um, exhibition that I didn't even show tonight. And and so it's worth a visit. Um, I think if mm -hmm. if I am not mistaken, it's starting in early August. So um, unfortunately, we're not having a great big grand opening like like we were hoping to, but right. it will be open and we people will be able to go through the um, the exhibit space starting in August. And um, it's definitely worth a visit. Um, James has done a really good job of research and, and it's very interesting coming from Forest Lawn because Forest Lawn has a really amazing stained glass collection themselves that uh, it goes back to kind of medieval glass. And so some of that class is actually going to be shown with with the Judson project as well. So it's it's um, if if you're in the area and can get up to to the museum, it's worth a visit up there. Yeah, that sounds very very cool. Uh, so uh, thank you, James, for answering some people on, in the chat <laughs> uh, as well. Um, a, a follow up to the uh, to the panels that you were talking about earlier. I see that somebody in the chat had followed up with that, uh, asking how thick are those four by eight panels and are they laminated? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, one of the things when we started into this was that if if you could make a four by eight panel, um, you know, artists love it, right? Artists want to know what the what the maximum thing is, right? Whereas when you take that to an architect, the architect wants to know, all right, what what, what are our constraints here? You know, what can we do? And so um generally um there's there's two things one is when we fuse glass when glass is in its natural state it wants to be six millimeters thick which is about a quarter of an inch so if we were just a fire glass if you have enough volume it's going to even out if it heats up it's going to be a quarter of an inch thick when you pull it out of the kiln right so um if you don't like for example if you try to just put a bunch of glass in the kiln and you don't constrain it somehow um uh, if you don't have enough volume, actually, sorry, to, to fit that, it'll it'll actually tighten up. So it'll actually get smaller. You know, you think about glass, when it gets hot, molten, it's just going to flow around. But actually, it actually gets, because it's trying to get to, to a quarter of an inch. So in its natural state, most of our panels we make to quarter of an inch. That being said, we can dam them up and make them thicker uh, for, for effect if we want. And then uh, we also do our own in-house lamination process where we do safety laminate them to glass. So we have a, a liquid laminate process that we uh, can use for both our fused panels and our leaded panels. Um, and so, um, yeah, we're always trying to, because we are kind of going out to a more public spaces, mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to take safety into, into um, consideration for that. Right. Uh, so uh, thank you, Tony Glander, for your follow-up on that. Um, Jeff Riley uh, asked, uh, why do you say that the eyes are the most important part of the resurrection window? Yeah, the, the head of Christ and specifically the eyes were, um, to me, kind of, I think, the most interesting, first of all, because it was the most challenging panel, right? The, the, mm -hmm. We started that project. Um, the head of Christ was kind of the, the most talked about and highly debated about, you know, they, they did not want to kind of a, a, a recognizable figure or, you know, kind of a, even a, a white figure, right? They wanted it to be kind of somewhat diverse. And so 
when Tim and Narcissus really kind of hunkered down on it, it was like, well, let's, let's use a lot of colors. And if you get into those eyes, you know, there's, there's hundreds of pieces just in the eyes themselves to create that kind of effect. And um, so to me, when I saw that kind of head come together, I realized, wow, this, this is something that's, that's really spectacular and, and um, has a lot of, um, a lot of uh, potential for, for future pieces. Oh, okay. Um, uh, now we're just running out of time here. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, uh, there's a, a couple of people who are asking um, kind of just about your studio in general and asking, you know, uh, once things are open or more open, uh, can people visit the studio? People are asking, can you take classes at the studio? What's what? what um, yeah, so we are about? we are still both of our facilities are working studios, so we don't really give classes. Um, if people are interested in like fuse glass and that kind of thing, you can take classes at Bullseye, which is next door to our our one for our South Pasadena location, and um, they're offering classes all the time. At least they will be, I'd imagine, in the future. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Uh, we did, um, before everything shut down, we did have a monthly tour at the studio. So um, we do have a, a tour that uh, goes through once a week. Uh, uh, sorry, once a month. But um, that obviously is, we've, we've shut that down until, until further notice. We're, we're just, right. you know, just can't kind of open that up. So, um, but um, we do have, you know, if you go onto our website, we're, we're pretty active on social media and our website. And you can kind of keep up with, with the activities that we have going on there. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for, for that. Thanks. For, so that's going to wrap it up for us here. Um, so David, first off, I just want to thank you so much uh, for supporting Vromans uh, as another, uh, you know, cultural institution, as we were talking about yeah. at the beginning, and uh, particularly at this time. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, independent bookstores are, are definitely in need of, uh, of the community support. And so we, we appreciate it. Yeah. Please buy, everybody, buy your book at Romans. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, everyone, uh, yes, uh, please listen to the author. Uh, <laughs> you can go ahead and uh, press that button there down there, click on that. It says buy uh, Jetson Innovation and Stained Glass. That'll take you to the Romans Bookstore website where you can uh, finish your uh, checkout there. Uh, like I said, uh, Romans uh, is doing online orders, but we're also doing... Um, uh, phone orders as well uh, for curbside pickup at this point. Um, so that when we have some available, we'll make sure to get those to you. Uh, David is also going to sign some copies, hopefully at some point in the next week or so, uh, and those will then be available at that point. Um, and uh, we, just to let everybody know, we will be having a limited opening at some point in hopefully in the near future, but uh, because of, uh, you know, just it's a big store with a lot of logistics and making sure that um, our staff and our customers are safe. Uh, we have to make sure everything's in, in place for that. But we do appreciate your support of independent bookstores uh, and um, we need you now more than ever. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, David, once again, Thanks so much. It was a real pleasure uh, talking to you and, and, and having you uh, give this, uh, this great presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, and thanks to everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. <laughs> All right. And just so everybody knows, uh, the presentation uh, will be available uh, to watch here on Crowdcast uh, after this live event is over. Once you're registered, you can use that same link and it'll be able to uh, play again. So if there's any parts you want to see again, you can uh, go ahead and do that. So. Everyone have a good night. David, thanks again. Bye.